Our next panel discussion is from MVT, MVP to growth, how to scale your startup. And we have an interesting line of panel of speakers. I'd like to welcome them one by one. Our first panelist is Vasan Subramanyam, CTO at Axel Partners India. Vasan is currently part of the venture development team at Axel, focusing on software and technology. He mentors startups with anything tech and helps them scale by sharing best practices. His specializations include web technologies, networking, security, agile processes, and good old plain common sense. At Axel, he is also involved in evaluating tech startups and due diligence. Prior to Axel, Vasan was the founder and CTO at Insta Health Solutions and has also held senior leadership roles such as managing director at Net, Continuing, uh, Net Continuum India. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Na Vasan Subramanian. Our next panelist is Venkat Raju, CEO of Chiron Global. Venkat is a technology executive with more than 25 years of experience in business, technology. He has been a CEO, entrepreneur, management consultant, CTO, chief architect, SVP of products, GM, and more. Having worked on Wall Street and in Silicon Valley and led various Fortune 500 companies, Venkat today is a mentor and active angel investor in the Indian startup ecosystem. Venkat, thank you so much for joining us. You can please uh, have your seats on stage. Our next panelist is Ashok Madhravalli, director at NASCOM 10,000 Startups. Ashok is currently director at NASCOM 10,000 Startups. Under his leadership, the NASCOM 10,000 Startup Warehouse Program has expanded to more than nine cities in India. As an apex body, NASCOM 10,000 Startups today brings together forces from the government, corporates, accelerators, VC firms, and startups around India to develop and enable the entrepreneurial culture in India. Please welcome Ashok Madhravalli. Our final panelist is Aprameya Radhakrishna, who is the founder and director at Taxi for Sure. Today, in his new avatar, Aprameya is an active angel investor and invests in high potential Indian startups. Please welcome Aprameya Radhakrishnan. And now to moderate the panel, I'd like to welcome on stage Mega Bhagat. A Rockefeller Social Innovation Fellow, Mega has effectively designed, program managed, and evaluated global development programs and set up global partnerships. She has created and led various new strategies for international programs, authored policies for ICT, IT government departments in India, set up geography operations, and led regional forums. At NASCOM Foundation, she set up operations for the organization in southern India, created and program-led a two-year partnership with Rockefeller Foundation, amounting to 16 million for a global research project in rural BPOs. She also consults on strategy at the Anita Borg Institute, where she has helped create and implement a university engagement program. Today, as a mentor, speaker, and coach for women leadership programs, she, she also hosts startup weekends and social entrepreneurship programs. Ladies and gentlemen, Mega Bhagat. And with that, we have the entire panel on stage. And now over to you, Mega. Thanks. Thanks, Mohan. Thanks for this opportunity. So I'm going to uh, dive right in. Uh, just a quick poll we wanted to take here is um, in the audience present today, uh, how many of you are developers, engineers at startups? Perfect. And how many founders here of tech startups? Great. So we just wanted to do that tip stick uh, before we jump right into the quest, uh, questions we, I wanted to bring up uh, to the panel. So I'm going to start with one common question that I thought I would bring up to everybody and uh, get to hear your thoughts on, which is that uh, MVP to growth. But before that, what is that one distinguishing factor of prototype to MVP? So when is it that a prototype becomes an MVP, even before we talk about growth? I'll go first. A uh, prototype is something that uh, not necessarily works completely. You use a prototype to demonstrate what is possible in a product, how it looks, before you launch a product. Okay, so, uh, but an MVP is a real product that has got real users, and users can use it. As, it. as the name says, it's a minimum viable product. All three are important. It's minimal, it's the core minimum set of features that you want to launch and your customers to use. It has to be viable, which means that it's working. People should be able to use it, and it's a complete product by itself. Yeah. And it should have value to the end customer. Uh, from my perspective, a prototype is a physical manifestation of your idea or a concept which was probably in your head or a PowerPoint. It's the first attempt to demonstrate the feasibility of, okay, this is the technology you came up with and here's a manifestation. 
from that to becoming an MVP, it is pr primarily from a customer perspective, whether it's a consumer or a business uh, customer, but it is really addressing one of their problems and it is something that is consumable from their perspective. So that's the bridge between prototype, which is demonstrating the feasibility of the technology, and product is much more from a customer perspective. Is, is this something that can be used for solving my problem? Yeah. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Ditlosion for in, inviting uh, and bringing uh, all of us here together. Uh, but I think uh, Vasan and uh, Venkat have already answered what is an MVP and what is uh, in a prototype. But I would just like to add, since there's a whole lot of developers in this room here, um, and most of you, I'm guessing, would come from an engineering background, that MVP in most cases turns out to be a most valuable product. And we try to over-engineer and build every possible feature that we can think of. Uh, and I think that is something consciously as a community we have to move away from uh, and that is something maybe I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, that's it from me. That's interesting. So this would be interesting to hear from you which is that um, MVP and uh, the whole conversation of now you should you're ready to hit uh, the ground to look at growth right and and it's it's a it's a huge word it's been mystified so much which is you know going into growth and hitting the growth numbers and are you ready to now go grow big right so uh, you've now on the both sides of the story right you were once at a stage where MVP to growth made sense and now you're talking to more startups so tell me what the, for you, while you were still with your startup, while at Taxi for sure, what was that one tipping point where you were like, now this is an MVP, and now is when we are looking at growth? Was there a tipping point, and what is that tipping point? And do you see that happening with startups you're talking to now? Yeah, so uh, when we thought of Taxi for sure, uh, we wrote it on a piece of paper uh, and said, okay, this is where a customer is, or we are, and these are all the cabs that are available, whether branded or local. And on a click of a button, uh, you should be able to get the nearest cab. You shouldn't be calling each cab operator separately, right? So we wrote that on a piece of paper, and then we came and trans translated it into a website first. It wasn't an app, uh, you know, back in 2011, but uh, it was a website. And uh, when, so we almost spent like six months trying to build that website, right? Uh, when we launched, uh, the first thing that happened was we needed a number and nobody was using the website. Everybody was calling us on the number 6060-1010 and suddenly we didn't have the backend to handle any bookings, right? So we opened up an Excel sheet and started putting uh, customer name, number, from, to, driver name, you know, all those things. And uh, basically started learning what the customer wanted during the journey of a, uh, during a taxi journey. So just before the uh, driver uh, was reaching him, he wanted to know the driver name and number. So from my phone, I would manually uh, enter a message and send it to the customer, right? So we kind of learned what the product should be overall. So what we imagined was a website, right? But then when we got the website up and running, nobody was using the website, nobody was booking there. What actually people wanted to do was, you know, leave all the website stuff because they didn't have a laptop in front of them all the time. They had a phone, they, had, they wanted to call and wanted to book, right? So that is when we started building uh, the actual product that customers wanted and we kept growing and app was another stage where you know we had to make people learn how to use an app and before we you know made consumers learn how to use an app uh, we had to make the drivers learn how to use the app right so which was uh, much tougher uh, so the minimum uh, viable product basically is is anything that uh, you know satisfies your customer <coughs> right uh, and without confusing them so you shouldn't be too many things you should be one thing and you're satisfying one need of that customer and you know that once you've got this unit correct as in one experience correct if you go and tell this to a million people all of them will like it right so I think that's the minimum viable product 
Great. Uh, Venkat, I'm going to ask you, so who should a startup founder or somebody who believes he has an MVP go to with the MVP? So, you know, for actually validation, for actually getting real insights into whether this is an MVP at all, who should he go to? So the very definition of MVP is uh, validated learning. So that must have happened uh, uh, before you claim to know you have an uh, MVP. Validated learning means you have understood the customer segment, who you are target audience. So now, uh, I also want to talk about uh, the topic here, MVP to growth, but I say there is another milestone. MVP to product market fit, then to growth, because growth is something where you're very, very sure that the product market fit has been achieved. That's when you crank it up and spend the money. But uh, uh, we, we had to be very careful in this phase between MVP to product market fit, and there are multiple definitions of what a product market fit is. Mm -hmm. Now, just because you have identified the MVP for a narrow segment, is this relevant for another segment, another geography? I still don't know. So you still need to be doing a lot of experiments and getting the feedback to get to that fit. So to answer your question, now that I have a validated learning for this narrow, defined by geography or demographic or whatever the case may be, now the target audience should be very, very clear. And you should be going and pushing and saying, did we really achieve the MVP, if not go back to the drawing board, but then at least achieve product market fit in the narrow definition of that segment, and then you crank it up. That makes sense. Ashok, going back to, you know, I'll connect this with what you were saying earlier, right, in terms of numbers, and in terms of um, most valued product. It's what it's core to people who are building it, and uh, therefore also the, uh, the whole thinking of moving to growth and therefore saying that now I need to quickly move to growth or also it's how the echoing is happening around them. So some insights into from an industry consortium perspective, right? What are you guys seeing? You, we, it's already gone through a journey and uh, with so many startups being coming out of the 10K programs. So what's the journey looking at? Are you seeing change in how founders are thinking? Uh, yeah. Uh, we have seen about, uh, at this point, uh, 15,000 applications coming into the program from over 85 cities. Uh, out of that, we have selected about 3,000 startups into the program. Uh, so you can see the number of startups that have got rejected. And the rejection uh, happens from all the, uh, in the uh, angels, the VCs, the community, uh, the startup community who looks at these applications. So a lot of the startups, which goes back to my earlier point, uh, was these are founders working on ideas. And uh, these are people who have worked at large companies like a Infosys or a Wipro, uh, and who have said, OK, I have a product idea or, or a you know, solution that I want to build, but without doing enough market research. And going to uh, Venkat's point earlier, uh, we, don't do, uh, we don't go enough out in the streets as founders and do enough validation. I think that's been the key learning for all the startups out there, uh, in, at least in the community that we have. People are writing you know, thousands of lines of code without doing the necessary validation. If, even if you look at the recent uh, uh, happenings with the food tech startups or with the laundry startups, I don't think those founders and those uh, you know, startups have done enough validation, enough research, speaking to the actual users. Uh, of course, one is, you know, your own aspirations that are, are, are passion that this is going to work. But I think the equally important factor is to have marry that with data and uh, make uh, decisions based on all the data that is coming in. Uh, I think that is very, very criti critical even as you build your MVP. And I think all of that data and research has to go into your MVP. And that is what we are seeing, or a lack of it. You know, like 15,000 applications, uh, there's a lot of noise and a lot of people wanting to do me to applications. At least in the, I mean, just going by one uh, sector, right, in the uh, education space, 25% of all the applications are in the education space. That's a huge number. And there's very little differentiation in the products that are coming out. Everybody has some kind of a learning management system or it's a, you know, a chat system for parents to interact with, you know, the, with the teachers and so on. It's the same, similar kind of products with very little differentiation. And I think that's a, a huge problem. 
That's, that's a great insight. Vasan, I'm going to come to you. And uh, acceleration, right? Uh, you're with an accelerator program. So uh, demystify one step before that acceleration. So uh, MVP, right? We've just spoken about it requires more than just simply saying, I have a product that I believe works, and now I should jump into growth numbers. What should growth look like for me? Three checkpoints that you would recommend to a founder before he or she is even considering growth as the next parameter in terms of scale, in terms of raising money, all of that. But before they come to you as an accelerator, three checkpoints that they should be following uh, when they even claim they have an MVP before they claim we want to go into growth. What would that be? Yeah. Uh, so uh, if, if, I, if I were to paraphrase your question, you're asking, OK, Somebody comes to us and says, okay, I've got an MVP, right? And then uh, what are those checkpoints you want to ask them whether they truly have an MVP or not, right? Yeah, first one is that they should have using customers who are liking the product, okay? Uh, it may be one or two, it could be 100, 200, but there should be somebody who's using it, and they're using it for the very reason that they want to use it, okay? So that's really, really number one. Number two is, although you have an MVP, you also want to see your target segment of the customer that uh, who are using it, okay? Is that scalable? Okay, is it, or is it very, very narrow? Okay, what's the kind of customer that is using and liking a product? How many of them are there? If, for example, yeah. you're, you're, you're making a product for a very, very narrow segment, like saying working women between the ages of you know, 20 to 23, right? So how many of those are there, and how many of them will actually discover your product, and how will they discover the product, and how are they gonna use it? So what's that number? So when you talk, before you talk about scale, you have to be, have an approximate number in mind, saying this is where is the limit. Okay, and this is how I'm going to attack that. Okay. The third thing is, of course, yeah, how are we going to market it? How are we going to reach those customers? Assuming that once you reach the customer, and then they are going to like your product, okay, but what the step and what the cost of acquisition of that customer? Okay, how are you going to get to them? Are you going to go to Facebook? Are it going to be ads? Or is it going to be word of mouth? And how is it going to work? So these are three things I would ask them to say, okay, are these th three things thought through before you want to talk about scale? Answers the question? Yeah. Thanks. Um, Apramaya, so now you talk to startups, right? Now you're meeting startups and you're looking at ideas. Uh, so where does, uh, where does a startup decide and should decide that it's now time to scale uh, from a perspective of not just the idea, but they've decided they've built a full-on product, right? So the, it was an MVP. Where, what is that tipping point where they know that they should now go on scale and therefore start raising funds accordingly, money accordingly? Uh, especially with your journey earlier, right? When was that tipping point of saying that let's look at scale in terms of numbers and customers? Yeah, so uh, most of the time, you know, you, you don't, when the product is working, you won't have time to sit back and think whether it's now time to, you know, scale or not. You would have started scaling. I completely and agree. It's more like a pull, right? There's yeah. some time, you know, it just clicks. And some, at one point in time, yeah. the more and more customers are asking more yeah. and more things. That's when, I think. So f for us at Taxi, for sure, we were always behind. Customers were asking for more stuff. Drivers were asking for more things. Uh, operators were asking for more things. We just didn't have time uh, for, to do anything. Um, so I don't think, you know, if you're at a stage where you're thinking whether you know, you, sh you should you scale or not? I think you're you're not there yet. Uh, you you'll already start scaling if uh, if you have the right product market fit. MVP. Yeah, but a lot of people don't uh, you know uh, have this uh, good problem. Okay, a lot of them they, they they need to market their product before they can acquire yeah. customers, right? So so her question really was, you know, yeah. when do you say that? One one more point then. So you know, if if you uh, also need to, so lots of our customers were through word of mouth. Right, uh, so if if people are not talking about your product, and if people are not uh, really you know organically growing your customer base, uh, that's also a sign that so if 90% of your customers are coming through paid channels for a long time, of course paid channels to get your initial set of thousand customers, let's say okay, uh, but if you have to keep paying, then that's not a product market fit, right? If you have a product market fit and 1,000 people become 10,000 people without you really spending money, I think that's, that's another uh, checkpoint you can have uh, on how many organic uh, new customers are you getting. 
So for you, then it means that organic growth or that organic uh, touch point with more customers is your first reality check. Yeah, I'm of talking about B2C. B2C, um, yeah, yeah, I completely agree, great. Uh, so I'm mindful of the time, so uh, I'm going to open it up to the audience for questions, to the panel. If you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll get a mic across to you. Any questions for the panelists? Okay, right at the back. One sec, let me get the mic across to him. Hi, I have a question to uh, Apramaya. Uh, so you said about organic gro growth, right? Can you reveal some numbers, like how many people you brought in initially through paid marketing? And like till what point it you know, became organic? So in our journey, you know, it was it was a continuous. So the market is so huge that you, we also want to accelerate. So we were we were always having a certain percentage which was paid, but let's say I take our initial 50 customers a day, right? Uh, all of it was organic, right? What would we do? We would ask uh, friends that we knew uh, in uh, companies like Infosys or otherwise who have intranets, right? to post uh, saying now get a taxi ride at 600 rupees to the airport, right? And that would get us customers. And since they would have a good experience, they would go back and now write organically that they had a good experience, right? right? Okay. And that kind of got our first few customers. Uh, once we raised money uh, and we really wanted to accelerate growth, uh, we knew there was a problem, we were solving it right. Uh, were we with the perfect solution? No. we were building technology to uh, suit uh, customers' needs. Uh, but then once we wanted to accelerate, uh, it's, it's now a problem of capturing market share. So if you don't accelerate, somebody else will capture market share. So hence, there'll be a balance. I'm talking about pre-funding days, it should be mostly organic. Right, so you're basically doing growth hacking. Yeah. Right, okay, thank you. If there are no other questions yeah, here, no okay, there are quite a few questions. I was thinking of asking a question myself. <laughs> One sec. Yeah, um, I know that there may not be a, uh, a specific answer, but uh, just wanted to get your point of view. Uh, so, uh, in the in the in, you know at the juncture of scaling or acceleration, right? Uh, what have you seen as uh, in maybe in your respective businesses the the a healthy ratio you know ratio of uh, long-term value versus uh, CAC or customer acquisition value. So what have you considered in your particular business a healthy measure of actual growth, uh, the actual ratio of uh, you know uh, long-term value versus customer acquisition? So what have you seen as something that has worked or something that at least is a measure of how healthy your growth is actually uh, in, in your particular business? Uh, Pramaya, you want to take it? No, I'm okay. Okay. <laughs> So, are you, are you talking about lifetime value of a customer? Yeah, LTV, okay. yeah. Oh, uh, LTV of customer, okay. <clears throat> yeah, so, uh, see, now, at, at Taxi for sure, I'll give you an example. Uh, till we all kind of uh, went after growth, right? Uh, we were operationally profitable at every ride, at every customer, rather. Uh, what were we doing? Uh, you know, if we spent 100 rupees to acquire a customer, uh, we were making about uh, 25 rupees uh, after all, you know, uh, operations at a unit level of a ride. So we needed that customer to book at least four times to break even on that customer, right? Uh, so our average repeat uh, when extended across a year was around, as in based on whether they were using app or phone and various numbers, but Let's say on an average it was about eight, nine when when we kind of uh, exited. On on an average, app was 20, right? Phone calls were probably four or five, right? So, uh, so uh, you know, as long as you're hitting that kind of a goal where you've spent 100 rupees to acquire a customer and you're making you've made money on that customer, then that's that's a good balance, right? Uh, but then all of us went after growth, and you know the market was much bigger. Uh, if we had gone in the same strategy, we would have taken longer to hit the same kind of numbers that uh, all the aggregators are hitting right now. So let me add to that. It de also depends on the product you have. If it's a niche product, it goes back to 
how many repeat orders, how much I am uh, extracting. But if it's a broader product, then uh, other functionality, how much can I upsell, cross-sell over the lifetime value uh, uh, or the relationship with the customer, then you probably need to be doing a lot more product development on the other features. So it, it depends. Yeah, I agree with both of them. Yeah, uh, fundamentally what Apramaya said, you know, if you have customer action cost, if you're making enough money out of the customer, yeah, you're good to go. That's, that's a healthy ratio. Okay, I'll ask a question. So all of you meet a lot of startups on a regular basis, and if you're okay taking names, is there one startup that kind of really impresses you when it comes to the way they're scaling? Um, or it could be something in the public eye, it could be something that you're secret and you're, you're open to sharing, or it could be something on the global uh, scale, uh, on the global platform as well. Any startup that you think has done a good job of scaling well from their MVP to their uh, growth stage, or something that none of us have heard of and something that impresses you? I'll go with one. Okay, uh, there was a speaker this morning here. I think his name was Sai. Uh, company name is Hashnode. I was quite impressed with the way they they came to me first. I met them uh, uh, about a year and a half back. Uh, they had a couple of servers on DigitalOcean and they were running their uh, um, so-called uh, uh, social networking for geek site. It was about you know, a handful of people were actually using it and then the way they've grown, today they've got about you know, um, 80,000 unique visitors per month coming uh, to their site. Uh, that I think is a very, very impressive growth. I really like them. Okay. Kind of. So I would like to call out uh, two of my portfolio companies. I happen to be an angel investor. One is Dhruva, which we all know has demonstrated, you know, tested in India, but I'm going after a global market. Uh, a lot of people aspire to do that. Very few have successfully done that. And Dhruva is a leader. And another one I would call out is uh, a company called Orangecape, and they have a product called Kissflow. And again, demonstrating, look, India is the best place for a SaaS company. If you are able to do it the right way, uh, you have a significant advantage over your Bay Area counterparts and elsewhere because of the cost and other differences. And again, these are two different leaders demonstrating how uh, startups from India can scale globally. Yeah, there are two companies that I can think of. One is a B2C company uh, called Maya. Uh, you know, uh, so they are a, a app, mobile app focused on uh, women's healthcare. Um, uh, so they uh, were in uh, the making for the last sev several years, and they've gone completely without spending almost nothing, gone from zero to six million users. Uh, just like very impressive, and a lot of growth hacks that they've implemented across. And their customers are spread across the world. And one thing that I would r really like to draw uh, focus on is the uh, kind of attention they have had to design and detail of the product and the end-to-end -end customer experience, which a lot of startups currently are, are not doing, but the kind of laser focus that they had on every aspect of design from the logo, the look, the entire experience was like fantastic. So that is one. And the other company from a B2B perspective is a company called Flutura. Uh, you know, they are in the you know enterprise, uh, you know IoT, you know uh, space. So they. Uh, uh, are a small team again, about 50, 60 people now, uh, and the uh, the focus that they've had, you know, and uh, it's very difficult to acquire customers uh, internationally, and the focus that they've had on getting uh, customers from you know, Japan, from Germany, and outbidding even you know large companies like G, right? And uh, I think one thing, is, and all of us know, enterprise sales is very, very hard, um, but I think just their tenacity. And, and not saying no to any meeting, and no matter how long it takes, right? And that is something that I would like to uh, draw upon. You know, it's and enterprise sales is hard, but that's that, that's the nature of the beast, right? And they've been at it for, and uh, that goes right from the guy who's doing sales right to the founder. Everybody has the same DNA, you know, to go for every single meeting and just be there. Yeah. That's uh, Flutura. Yeah. F L U T U R A. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, globally, uh, if we talk about, uh, I'm not talking about any Indian startup in particular. But I think uh, the way Snapchat has grown uh, and really challenged Facebook, and Facebook's going crazy trying to copy them, but 
can't keep up with them, right? Um, so I think uh, the way they've understood uh, their customer and brought out uh, this whole uh, cult of uh, users, uh, which are very loyal to Snapchat and you know the use cases on Snapchat, of course. Uh, I think that's that's great, and I think uh, it's it's now the right time for Indian startups also to start thinking uh, very fundamentally about users. Uh, get into the psyche and you know build such uh, globally scaling companies. Right. Thank you, Mega. Back to you for your final thoughts and. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for that. So, so I think with a lot of uh, you know early stage uh, founders here and uh, developers here, so I think it's the key takeaway, if any, here would be that uh, you know it's it's very uh, sexy and it's very cool to start thinking of growth and especially with everybody around echoing that. But for an MVP, it's uh, I would go back to what Ashok said earlier, which I think is uh, the best way of saying it that. But whether it's the most viable product or is it the most valued product to yourself, right? And probably that's the checkpoint we all want to have before we think of growth and move into growth. So I think I'm going to close on that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohan, for having us over here Thank and so giving much. us this opportunity. Yeah. Small token of appreciation for our, all our panelists. If you could just hand it over to them. Big thank you to all the panelists, and thank you so much, Mega, for moderating this panel. Can we have another huge round of applause for all of them? Thank you so much.